Four times 100 meter freestyle relay. The world record, of course, held by the fantastic East German women. The Russian doping scandal starts all the way back in November of last year. Back in 1986, Sport is a great way to better understand the past, kind of a window into exploring the past because the, the broader structures of the society are reflected in those sporting organizations. What's going on in the sports space often um, overlaps what's going on outside of the sports space. And no other sporting arena has seen political implications more than the Olympics. Originally started as a way to shed nationalist ties and bring together the international community, they soon devolved into a pedestal for the very nationalist views they sought to fight. Modern Olympic nationalism began during the Berlin Games in 1936, where Nazi leader Adolf Hitler created one of the largest shows of national pride and force in history, and a true demonstration of the political power of the Games. Decades later, this field of power was once again situated in a divided Germany. After holding the games in Munich, West Germany in 1972, forces in East Germany began to put into motion events that would establish them as one of the preeminent athletic nations in the world. In 1976, everything would change. Illegal performance-enhancing drugs in the form of anabolic steroids changed everything for the U.S. women's team and East German women. We, we heard from the beginning that, that of, that, of the Olympics that these girls had, we knew they were on steroids. They weren't really a, a force to be reckoned with in 72, so by 73 at World Championships, they were winning all these events. And um, that was my first meet out of the country, so it was kind of a rude awakening for me because I was so, I was very naive about international swimming, you know, and it was a lot of pressure for me. The East Germans were soon becoming a force to be reckoned with. Fast and nimble, they would go on to take 11 of the 13 women's swimming events in Montreal. But this was not without a noticeable change. I can remember, you know, I was with Camille and Wendy and Janice, I think it was three of us, we're leaving the pool to go into the bathroom. And we marched into the bathroom. And I remember us hearing the voices. And we all looked at each other and we said, we must be in, you know, because it's all in French. We thought, well, okay, this must be the men's bathroom. So we marched back out, looked at the sign, saw that it was women's, and went back in. That's how deep their voices were. Beyond their voices, the women went through immense physical change, putting on muscle mass at an accelerated rate and increasing their endurance and speed at an unheard of level. They were very, they were very uh, de more developed than our, our women, by far. I mean, I felt like I weighed a lot because I went from 120 pounds or whatever, and I, I gained like six pounds. I got up to 126 or 24 when I was at the Olympics. These girls must have been 170, and they were all muscle. The consequences for using steroids vary greatly. However, many East German women swimmers had problems with hormonal shifts, sterility, ovarian cysts, birth defects in their children. One shot Perter even had to go through a sex change because she could no longer determine if she was a man or a woman due to the treatment. Over 10,000 athletes were doped, many without their knowledge. Some were even as young as 10 years old. But there are also certain uh, forms of doping that are associated with a uh, higher likelihood of developing cancer, for example. Um, so this is also some, something of, of concern. Um, and, and that affected men, male and female athletes alike. But, but I think 
the 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 worst uh, is is the kind of hormonal uh, treatment, especially for swimmers. The change takes place over time, but um, for women who are taking anabolic steroids, they start to grow facial hair, their voices deepen. Um, internally, they may start to experience liver damage. Um, their genitals um, start to change. Their hormonal production obviously changes, um, and Perhaps um, the part that has the most immediate life, potential life consequences is that they get incredibly aggressive and moody with these dramatic mood swings. In 1974, the state uh, decided to really combine the efforts uh, uh, of uh, the Staatssicherheit, the, the clubs, as well as these kind of state-run uh, boarding schools that were, you know, boarding schools as well as training facilities for the most gifted athletes in the GDR. Um, and they moved in four-year cycles, uh, four-year cycles, um, to try out um, uh, performance-enhancing substances um, and to, um, you know, um, really build in kind of Olympic cycles of four years. But they also anticipated that within this cycle, whatever drug they came up with, would be detectable by you know, enhanced testing anyway. Barbara Payton's daughter, Kim, dealt firsthand with the steroid-riddled East Germans, where they kept her from the podium on one of her best events, the 100 free. I know Kim swam the 100 free, placed fourth, broke the American record. She was American record holder when she went home, and still placed fourth. Coming into the 1976 Olympics, both the public and press expected the U.S. women's team to continue their success from the 1972 Olympics in Munich, where the women won eight golds and 17 medals in total. But when reality sunk in that the women's team may not win a single gold that year, the press attacked. Isn't it funny, though, when you think about it, how the press can be? I mean, they, they didn't believe anything was going wrong or on with anybody, and, but they still didn't stop ask, asking questions. Like, how do, you, how do you tell an Olympian that they're not performing up to the par of other Olympians in the past? How, how do you even begin to ask a question like that? I mean, seriously, how do you even begin to say that you're not, you're not as talented as the other groups of American women that have come into the, at, of the Olympics? And we broke every American record there was in all the events. I wish, I wish we could have had an Olympics like 72 or even 84 where it was more, well 84 they didn't have all the, the, the block countries coming, but I just wish we would have had a more uh, even playing field because you wait all these years to go to the Olympics to make an Olympic team and then, and then you have to have these kind of obstacles. But then, you know, a lot of our friends made the 80 Olympic team. Despite this hardship and lack of recognition, the swimmers came closer together than ever to face the adversity from both the East Germans and their own country. After not having won a single gold medal the entire games, only one event remained, the 4x100 meter free relay. It was the team's last chance to win a gold and show the world what they were truly made of. One race, eight lengths of the pool, four different swimmers. The four swimmers, Shirley Babishoff, Wendy Boglioli, Jill Sterkel, and Kim Payton, were nervous and full of anticipation. They wanted this race more than anything. They wanted to win clean. They were off, East Germans and Americans neck and neck. If you turned away for a second, the leader would change. The American women wanted to win. They needed to win. The last chance for gold. A final push. The women dug deep. The final turn at the wall came. Claudia Hempel versus Shirley Babishoff. Each fighting with every stroke. Flying through the water. The finish only moments away. Closer and closer with every stroke. They had done it and they had done it in style. They had not only won the race, but they had set a new world record with a time of 3.4482 seconds. Emotions ran high and everyone embraced. Not only had they beaten a group of women who were doped and nearly superhuman, but they had beaten the record that was set nearly a month before by the East Germans themselves. It was a moment that would live on with those women for the rest of their lives.
just made us feel so good that we knew we did it on a clean slate. We did it on a, uh, we did it on a fair playing field within our, you know, within our team, and we did it, we did it without using any enhancements. It was all pure talent and adren adrenaline. I mean, those girls were amazing. I mean, they couldn't have done a perfect race. More perfect race, I should say. It was a victory well earned as the swimmers got to parade the American flag on the pool deck. Chins held high, smiles on their faces, a look of bliss forged in adversity and hardship. Feeling that in the end, the light does hold off the darkness. Sadly, the events that transpired in Montreal did not prove to many that doping does not pay. To this day, hundreds, if not thousands of athletes still dope. Just from 1968 to 2012, 140 athletes were caught doping at the Olympics, but many are not even caught. The use of performance enhancers is, is part of sport, and from, you know, the late 19th century and really the opening decade of the 20th century onward, people are always looking for ways in which to enhance their performance that aren't kind of uh, defined as wrong morally or potentially harmful health-wise for kind of short-term short but also long-term games. For, for the GDR, uh, especially the Olympics, where there's one moment to shine, right? uh, this, this small uh, country, 18 million people, that's clearly not, uh, um, that's clearly a kind of a foreign imposition by the Soviet Union. Um, that has that makes headlines only when it builds walls to <laughs> wall in its own citizens. So um, uh, that that is the one shining moment for 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 the GDR. So the athletes themselves had done nothing wrong, um, especially when we're talking about children and coaches and trainers, basically surrogate parents, adults who young people trusted to help them achieve their Olympic dream and also bring a claim to the GDR um, were, you know, that's a form of coercion, um, especially when they, in many cases, were told they were just vitamins. All these pills that they were taking were just vitamins and the injections. Um, sometimes these substances were slipped into their food. In interviews after 1990, there are some athletes who uh, professed that they didn't know uh, um, that they uh, had to take drugs. Um, I, I find this, to be honest, very difficult to believe. Um, uh, most athletes interviewed afterwards uh, suggested that they were perfectly aware that they were taking drug uh, enhancing, uh, performance enhancing uh, uh, things, but they were not quite aware of what that actually was. They were also told that uh, this was kind of standard and that the other nations would, of course, also be uh, be testing, so any ethical concerns about uh, you know enhancing your own performance illegally at the expense of other athletes uh, were kind of thwarted away by this argument that everyone was doing that. For GDR athletes, uh, the idea would just be that their pharmaceutical uh, uh, work better than those of of uh, the American competitors. Um, so they would not, the idea that they were cheating someone out of a deserved medal uh, um, didn't occur to them. Uh, it is only after 1990 that several of them have, have come out and said, you know, we, we cheated and, uh, you know, this clearly went at the expense of an athlete who did not cheat. Even today, doping scandals are being brought to our attention and oftentimes not until years after are they even caught. This can be seen with the recent indictment of seven Russian nationals who hacked into 40 sports and doping groups' servers as retaliation for WADA's report about the systematic doping campaign the Russians used during the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi. More specifically, this indictment alleges a conspiracy to use computer hacking to obtain non-public personal health information about athletes and others in the files of anti-doping agencies and sporting federations in multiple countries, and to release that stolen information selectively and sometimes misleadingly. 
All of this was done to undermine those organizations' efforts to ensure the integrity of the Olympic and other games. Uh, you know, the question of, uh, well, um, let, let me ask back, does everyone uh, get, get caught? Um, is, that, is that really the case? I mean, what is the, what is the, the figure in the shadow that we just don't know about? Um, can we really with certainty say that, um, uh, you know, the athletes of um, even recent Olympics are not doped, even though the efforts of detecting doping clearly have augmented uh, considerably. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know um, if, if, uh, if it doesn't pay. Um, the cynics would say that the testing science is always playing catch up and that people who are incentivized to win at all costs uh, are willing to do whatever it takes to win. And if that means entering gray area spaces, right, if it's a drug that's not illegal yet, you can convince yourself that what you're doing is technically legal and within the bounds and rules of sport. This is going on right now. I think the, the biggest step forward in, in all of uh, in fighting doping um, is not necessarily the frequency of the tests, well, though this is important, but is to keep uh, the samples and uh, to, to uh, uh, retroactively then uh, detect doping if uh, you have new investigative tools. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's how we know that, you know, Lance Armstrong is a, is, is a wonderful case here. Um, if we look at his past samples uh, now with new technologies, we can pretty much say that he was doped then. Uh, so, so I think uh, the only way to prevent that uh, doping pays is to really be able to track athletes over a long period of time and uh, with ever increased doping detection methods because the, 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 those who try to find dopers are always one step behind, between, uh, behind those who do dope. So uh, in order to catch up you have to allow for this kind of long durée of, of, of detection. It's highly competitive, uh, a lot depends on this. Um, clearly we can also associate uh, in today's uh, world uh, a dollar amount to every medal, right? I mean, we, researchers can directly say, you know, winning a medal in this uh, category or in this event, in this Olympics, translates into roughly this amount of sponsoring money afterwards, right? So, so it's highly competitive. There's a, there's a prestige involved. There's a monetary aspect involved. Um, it would be very surprising if, uh, if some people wouldn't cheat in this, right? That's to be expected. Um, at the end of the day, we should not expect that uh, athletes are, you know, different from, from the rest of the population, some of whom also cheat on exams or, or, or such, right? Um, so uh, cheating is to be expected. We have to test. We have to be able to, to test for, for over decades. We have to ever improve in our detection methods. Um, and. And, and we also have to be really willing to also accept uh, the kind of uh, national shame that comes with uh, taking medals away from athletes. And here is something where I think we're also responsible, right? We, we, we cheer on our team. We, we, we are happy when our athletes are doing well. We, we celebrate them if they win. Uh, we despise them if they lose. Uh, so we, we're part of this, this mechanism too, um, so uh, I think it also has a lot to do with changing our attitudes and expectations on, on athletes. The amount of doping in both international and national sport even sparked a meeting on Capitol Hill where American swimmer and the most decorated Olympian in history, Michael Phelps, spoke in front of Congress to plead for better anti-doping organizations and tests. It's a privilege to, to be here to share my thoughts and perspective on the issue of clean sport, which is important to so many athletes and to sport in general. I competed internationally for over 15 years and had the tremendous honor to represent the United States in five Olympic Games and six World Championships. Without question, many of my proudest moments have been representing my country in international competition. 
There's no greater feeling than standing on top of the podium, watching the Stars and Stripes rise as the national anthem plays. The Rio Olympics were special for me because it gave me the opportunity to end my career on my terms and to do it with my wife, Nicole, and son, Boomer, watching. But it was also unique because of increased doping concerns. I watched how this affected my teammates and fellow competitors. We all felt the frustration. Looking back over my career and knowing how difficult it is to get to the highest levels of sport, I can't help but wonder how the next generation of athletes will be able to do it if this uncertainty continues. Obvious efforts are being made to stop doping in the sporting community, but the eventual question becomes, is it even possible? A saddening thought is that cheaters will always find a way to cheat. But winners, just as the four swimmers who against all odds toppled the East Germans in one final race, always find a way to win, and to win clean. <laughs>